Good afternoon and welcome to the Fitchburg Historical Commission, August 25th, 2022 meeting. Um, I would like to now call this meeting to order. Uh, please be advised that FATV is conducting an audio and video recording of this meeting for public broadcast. So thank you, FATV, for doing that. Um, I would ask that anyone else in the audience who is recording this meeting to please identify themselves for the record now and by standing and stating your name and address. Okay, no one. Um, thank you very much. Um, what I would like to kind of move to our first agenda item, uh, which is review and approval of our last meeting, July 28th, 2022. And do I have a motion to approve or comments on this on the minutes? I have one comment on there, Keith. Yep. Um, just just a typo on the members list. No. It was on my it was on my last name. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you had it, you had it right in number one. So. Uh, okay. Like yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> oh. That's all, just that one spelling correction. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. We will um, we'll have that corrected. Um, any other comments or revisions uh, to the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes uh, as amended. So move. A second to approval? Second. All second. second. All in favor, uh, raise your hand, commission members. Um, opposed, abstain. Um, very good. Uh, minutes approved as amended. Um, is, uh, is Matthew there from the library? Yeah, I am. Okay, hi, Matthew. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Are, are, is your team ready to make your informal presentation or do you want to wait a little bit? I was just checking the, um, I can't see who all is in attendance virtually, but uh, if Jeff Hoover from Tap A is online, I think at that point we'll be ready to go ahead. Okay, I don't see Jeff signed on at the moment. Um, do you... Um, Maybe as we kind of move forward here, do you want to just uh, maybe phone Jeff to see if he is? I, you know, sure, I can do that. And uh, just just feel free to interrupt us if when you know what his information is. So, sure. okay, thank you very much. If you can click on participants at the bottom, and you can see who's on. Okay, let me at the bottom of the whole screen. It's in the, the ribbon at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. Okay. See where it's green as the share screen to the left of that. I, I see Scott Hobart is there. Okay. And uh, perhaps um, I think Sam Blair is, is on the phone here with us too. So I think that's good. Uh, but I do not see I do not see Jeff yet. So All right. We okay. can we can um, move back at least one position in the uh, in the agenda. Keith, so we can keep the moving. Oh, checking with Jeff. Yep, we'll be here for a while. So it, whenever uh, your team is ready, we can uh, put it in at that time. So, sure. all right, terrific. Um, let me go back to. Um, so we will uh, with with uh, without any um, uh, objections, we'll uh, we will hold off on item number two, the Fitchburg Public Library. We we'll move on to the Fade Club application for non applicability. Um, I can give you a quick update on this uh, for uh, those others attending the the Fay Club, uh, which is to the west of the library, I think we all know the building, um, is also is uh, also in the Monument Park Local Historic District. 
um, they have applied for they're they're actively planning to start um, some repair and restoration work on their building. Uh, we have reviewed their uh, scope of work on it, and we have issued a certificate of non-applicability regarding the um, application of the uh, historic district design guidelines and application process. Um, they are probably starting as we speak, where they might be uh, now I, I just heard from the contractor that they had had a, a lift on the building and uh, getting up to the top of the, uh, this is a uh, 1870s, 1880s um, uh, Gothic uh, revival building uh, by the firm of uh, John Upjohn and uh, could have been uh, a little bit more research if it was actually he was a designer or if others in his firm or perhaps his son. Um, but a, a great example uh, of architectural treasure here in Fitchburg. Uh, they are doing their due diligence uh, and um, speaking with them, they're, they're finding additional um, damaged uh, decorative pieces uh, particularly on on the top portions, it was difficult to see from just a ground level, and they have a, a a man lift that they're able to start inspecting it, and they're saying they're seeing a bit a bit more damage to uh, the the uh, masonry work, which first site it appears to be brownstone. Um, we are not sure until we get uh, they're able to analyze it a little bit more whether it is indeed brownstone or what is called a brownstone terracotta, which is a artificial uh, molded terracotta uh, ceramic type of product that was very popular in the day. And our, oh, I believe our old city hall uh, that uh, was recently um, renovated also had some uh, terracotta decoration, uh, particularly on the front facade. And I think there are some other throughout Fitchburg and, and kind of an interesting piece that a lot of this terracotta was initially manufactured in Massachusetts here in, in Worcester uh, from some research I've uh, seen. And it, it is uh, finding out perhaps it was more pre prevalently used as a substitution to uh, limestones, granites, and marbles, and brownstone types of decoration uh, in many cases. So interesting, the, uh, they're not going forward with the repair of these things until we, they, uh, we communicate with them and being sure that it's, uh, they're doing in-kind type of work that uh, is, uh, uh, preserving the building for you know uh, generations to come. So we'll keep you posted on this. Uh, there, I think the Fay Club and their property owner organization are are you know really dedicated to do a great preservation job on this for their building, and uh, we're working in good partnership with them to uh, uh, work alongside with them. So we'll keep you posted on what's happening with that. Um, update on the proposed item number four, update on the proposed demolition delay study. Uh, we've been looking at this for uh, actually several years. And um, I believe Don has just uh, sent out to all of the commission members a kind of the most recent update on this. And any discussion or Don, any thoughts on uh, where we might be going forward with this or others? Well, the, uh, the ordinance as we have it now seems to be pretty much in order. It's, it's <laughs> ready to go. Right, it really is. Uh, but our concern is that uh, Reaction. Um, Educate, educating. 
Because they need to educate. Well, you haven't had one. Mate. Up to this point, why do we need one now? And you could cite all of the historic buildings that have been lost and destroyed over the last I mean, 50, Too many years. years. <laughs> um, and, and the idea of the demolition delay is just to explore alternatives mm -hmm. to demolishing. Because that, that often is, for, well, old building, let's demolish it. You know, tear it down, put up something else. Often it's cheaper, uh, more ecological, uh, more historic to preserve the older building. And the, but you can't do that if it's already demolished. <laughs> so let's step back and, 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 and take a look. And that's, that's all that this uh, ordinance proposes. But there, uh, as we found the last time we uh, proposed it, there was a very strong reaction against it. And even pointing out that 150 or so communities in Massachusetts have demolition delay ordinances. They say, well, what about the others that don't? <laughs> well, they're unfortunately not such historical cities as Fitchburg. Um, and and as, as a historian myself, I can I, I just feel very strongly that a historic city like Fitchburg really cries out for adult demolition delay ordinance. Um, so this so what what I put together is uh, the beginnings of a of a uh, handbook uh, for educating for people who who want to find out more. Uh, about it. A lot of the material I got from the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Mm -hmm. And um, so, along with the proposed ordinance, we can also provide the handbook. Oh, I think that's wonderful. If, if you need some help, I'd be happy to help. All right. Thank you. Take a look at it. Yeah, I will. Yes. Some suggestions I will. for improvements. Mm -hmm. So that's um, the other one. Very good, thank you. Um, I was I'm in the process for uh, kind of kind of multiple reasons of kind of creating a a chart or table, if you will, of um, Fitchburg along with uh, many surrounding communities um, around us. In what particular? Uh, if they have various uh, bylaws uh, re reference to preservation types of work. I'm also including uh, some of the smaller, uh, what are designated gateway cities uh, in Massachusetts that are, uh, I think, like below 100,000 uh, population, uh, similar to Fitchburg. And I, I know the state is designated our, our city, Fitchburg, as a gateway city and, and kind of recognizing the, you know, the, the terrific heritage that the gateway cities have. And, um, you know, as, as you know, looking at what other gateway cities are doing uh, for their uh, protection of their properties and revitalization, et cetera, um, could be a guide to what uh, we as a commission do and kind of advising what uh, other uh, or, or city administrators and departments and so forth uh, perhaps do and, and kind of recognizing what, what cities do have demolition delay that are similar, similar to ours uh, or other preservation types of um, uh, background types of things. So, um, so uh, once I have that chart together, I will, I will share it with everybody also, and maybe it be, it's either incorporated in the handbook or we kind of use it <laughs> however. But uh, so we can kind of uh, work out, you know, kind of our next steps uh, and kind of game plan forward. And um, I believe as Ellen said, what you know, exactly how can we 
uh, present and uh, to the community at large what the uh, what the issues are with demolition and uh, what perhaps an advantage of having just a delay. It doesn't stop the demolition of anybody's property. Um, you know. You know, what what that delay period can be used for and uh, just suspending for a period of time before uh, either alternatives are, are gone forward or the actual demolition takes forward. So it's, it is a delay. It's not a restriction uh, in total. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, any other any other thoughts from members or? Yeah, I think that's good. And um, it, as you're coming up with it, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm also kind of gathering a list of our city officials, our council members and things and what boards they're in and being able to maybe make presentations to them and, and perhaps, you know, open to their ward members and so forth also to kind of get input and uh, feedback on on what we're proposing and, and you know, uh, educating the public on uh, what our thoughts are and what other communities have done. Okay. Um, before, I, I don't see Jeff on the participants yet. Uh, is Jeff, are you there? He advised that he was gonna be available at 3.30, so we can probably tackle an additional agenda item before. Okay, so. terrific. Thank you very much. All right, uh, item number five, update on the proposed Stonewall <clears throat> Preservation <throat> Ordinance Study. Okay, so this, this is another one of the demolition delay type. Uh, and I actually uh, was alerted to that there is a problem here. Um, in terms of stonewall, uh, historic stonewalls, and their preservation uh, by Robert Thorson uh, gave a talk through the library. Uh, and I listened to it on the by the Zoom. And I, I understood immediately what he was saying because all around us we have these stone walls. But nobody pays much attention. I certainly didn't pay much attention to them. Uh, and some of them are quite historic in, in terms of going way back. Others are uh, more recent. But there, there don't seem to be any guidelines for dealing with them. There, there is a... Uh, a section of one of the city ordinances regarding stone walls on scenic roadways. Um, and that, yes, that's true, but there are also historic stone walls off in the woods. <laughs> that, well, what do you do? What do you do with them? Do uh, you leave them as they are? Do you try to? Repair them? Do you? What's the idea? And uh, Robert Thorson's written a book that I drew heavily upon uh, to create an ordinance and, and drew on other stone wall ordinances in other communities in Massachusetts uh, to provide guidelines for city officials and for conscientious homeowners who want to know who. Is this a historic stone wall? Is this something I should be concerned about? Is this something I can paint over? Um, or should I check with the historic mission? Uh, um, so it's just to alert people, provide some guidelines for dealing with these uh, stone walls. They are a, a very important part of the heritage of New England. And but they are disappearing at a very rapid rate. And my concern is like the passenger fiction. One day there are lots of them, mm -hmm. and the next day they're all gone. Now, 
Stone walls are not passenger pigeons, but it's the same principle. If as long as one ignores them, continue, well, they will continue to disappear. Right. And if we can alert people that there are some stone walls that are worth preserving, uh, and stone walls that are off in the woods, the probability is you should leave them as is for archaeological reasons. <laughs> uh, don't try to repair them. Don't you know, just that, that's just the way they are. That's right. you know, like a patina. <laughs> um, but others do need repair, especially if they're uh, in danger of falling down and, and creating harm. So then how do you go about repairing? Uh, and what are, what are the parameters for doing so? So that's what this uh, ordinance is uh, meant to do, because I don't expect city officials to be experts on stone walls. Well, they took everything. Connected. Right. Oh. So they, they, can, they can at least read it, they, another handbook there, put it together at the organs and have, have some ideas of how to approach these issues. Well, well since you uh, brought this to our attention, <clears throat> I've become aware of the fact that when I leave right across, right across the street is a stone wall, and I've become it's interesting to see where there still are remnants because houses have been built in between. And of course, the, the stones have disappeared. And um, I haven't gotten out, you know, I haven't gotten out of the car to find out if there's any um, connections to, to the stone walls, you know, going into the properties. But it's been sitting there for years. And it, I thought to myself, I wonder where these stones came from. You know, so I was curious. So this is this would be interesting for all of us. And, and Ellen, you, you have a particular interest in stones. I do. Yes. I do. Uh, we do need to we do need to address the, these stones. These stones. Oh, yes. on there. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Yes, I did see that on, on the computer. So again, any uh, feedback that you can provide on the ordinance so okay. and book them is in the very beginning stages. Uh, yeah. Don, did you did you happen to in your research find out uh, about boundary line stone walls or stone walls uses property boundaries? Oh yes, they're 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 uh, person is very good about cat, uh, categorizing, uh, creating a typology basically mm -hmm. of stone walls, so you know what to look for now. Uh, or at least I think I know what to look for. Um, and it would be nice if somebody like Charles could go around. Taking some pictures of the different yeah. kinds of stone walls uh, that we have. There are some in the book, but uh, pictures aren't. I yeah. follow them. But I believe at a earlier meeting this spring when we were uh, discussing this, uh, Susan Navarre, the executive director of the Historical Society, was in attendance also. And she did get back in touch with us uh, by email saying that she would be interested in having uh, the Historical Society uh, perhaps uh, join us in some educational types of uh, awareness, if you will, of, you know, particularly in Fitchburg, where we have a certain kind of a rich topography. We certainly have some uh, colonial and post-colonial uh, land divisions and field divisions that were certainly done with stone walls, uh, typical of a lot of Massachusetts type of things that, that Don mentioned. Um, and perhaps even the... Uh, uh, our Rollstone Quarry, uh, which I think we're all aware of where the, the Rollstone came from, was Thank certainly you. an active uh, granite quarry for many, many years. Uh, and, and a lot of uh, stone construction here in Fitchburg and, and elsewhere uh, is, is from that resource. And because of the river and the railroad and the various roads and things that we have, a lot of this quarried stone has been used for bridges, for viaducts, for or, um, culverts, for building foundations, for you know the huge 
stone dry laid retaining walls that we see on many of our streets uh, that hold up a lot of our, uh, you know, our, our streets and buildings. Thinking of High Street as you go from Academy Street on, oh, yeah. on up toward, I think it ends up at Mechanic Street, there's a huge big dry laid uh, granite wall uh, back behind the city stables, which is part of the proposed uh, Academy S Street Historic Street. Educational yeah. District, um, and being uh, perhaps recognized on the National Register of Properties, also yeah. are in the process of being evaluated. So it, it it's a kind of um, our our boundaries and and uh, field marking uh, stone walls. And our uh, quarried and constructed use of stone, particularly here in Fitchburg with our own quarry, uh, those are things that not you know we don't think about as as we look at our city. But when we look at our city compared to other cities and look at the infrastructure and uh, the topography and things, it, it, we are, I think, in my opinion, rather unique and being able to. Uh, record and maybe capture and discuss and present, um, you know, perhaps with the help of the historical society. I, I'm, and I think that I know Andy, you you do some work with uh, Susan at the at the society, and is that something um, uh, a small group of us could maybe coordinate that uh, and see if it we could help in any way to uh, start some public forums and, and just, you know, public awareness. And, you know, maybe at these forums, there could be some mention that we're considering a, a way of uh, uh, a review process before these older stone uh, things are, are changed that we'd have an opportunity to uh, at least educate uh, those that are, you know, it's private property in, in, in most cases and uh, be able to educate uh, the value of, you know, the heritage and things that, uh, that they might be preserved. So it, that's something, Andy, you could maybe talk with Susan about? Yeah, sure. I, I have talked with her about the, the Stonewall Preservation Project. Um, mm -hmm. I've done a little research at the historical and did find one article it was written in the Sentinel about uh, the granite retaining walls in town. So now some of those have been getting repaired. Um, I've, I've done some research in newspapers.com, searching through old Sentinels. Yeah. And, and you'll see uh, realty transfers where the borderline is a stone wall. So you'd think those would have to be maintained. That's right. Um, and I was going to ask if it's okay, I forward Don's documents to Susan. Oh, yes. As part of this project. Yeah, ter terrific. Let, let's see if we can make some headway by the next me next meeting on it. It was kind of a, a little bit more of a game plan. And uh, I, I appreciate everybody's work on this. And uh, um, I think we should continue to keep this as an active uh, piece of our uh, things that we're working on. So. Absolutely. Can I ask a question? Sure. Another one? <laughs> and another one? Um, um, I was wondering uh, if we've given any more thought to this whole fine thing, because I know that was a concern from a, 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 a oh, yeah. city yes. resident, as well as uh, the board wasn't really happy, or the commission wasn't really happy with the, the amount um, yeah, of the last I, meeting. So I was wondering if we can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I took I took that amount from a, a city ordinance. Right, yeah. And, uh, but, I think that's something that the city council should decide. So I, okay. I changed to changed it to be determined, the amount to be determined. Okay. That's a good question. Very diplomatic. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I would maybe um, by perhaps getting some either educational things in, in maybe the historical society newsletter, or maybe we could uh, collaborate on a uh, public presentation. Um, 
again, e either with perhaps bringing a consultant back that uh, you saw at the library or, um, you know, if it's possible, Andy, you come up with some things that we could uh, um, start working toward a, a what stone walls we kind of talking about and being able to give visual examples of uh, various pieces. You know, I'd be happy to kind of uh, or help with some of those things also. Uh, I'd like to volunteer to get in touch with Charles. Okay. And I'll, I'll list, uh, you know, so he doesn't have to figure it out. Now. Just give him a list. I'll try to think of different areas. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, for those in attendance, Charles, uh, our, our seventh member who was in. Your, your sound, your sound is. We're losing you, Keith. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, a better. Yeah. Uh, does that sound better? Uh, Charles, our seventh member, who wasn't able to make it today, is a, a professional photographer and uh, is good with images. So that's that's who we're refer referring to on this. Um, any other things on the Stonewall Ordinance? I, I saw for a moment that Jeff was there um, from Tape Associates. Um, That's uh, right. Dude. Hi. <laughs> hi, Jeff. Welcome. Good. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Terrific. Uh, so what I would like to do is uh, next go to our passed over uh, agenda item number two, Fitchburg Public Library proposed renovation and addition informal design presentation. And I believe we have uh, many people from the library, uh, a team, perhaps building committee. Uh, maybe if those, those present, maybe if you want to just go around and identify yourselves and we'll end up with Jeff identifying himself. Oh, sorry. Sharon Bernard, past director of the library. Welcome. Charles, director of facilities. Thank you, Matt Sturz, project manager with Collier's Project Leaders for the Owners Project Management Project. Mary Delaney, I'm the chief procurement officer for the city. Uh, I don't know why the camera's not coming over this way to look at us. <laughs> 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 AJ, AJ turned deep into the state university. <laughs> I know, that's a couple of I think it is. Is it really? Oh, I think it's trapped. See, it was too hard out over here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bill McShee on the building committee for the library. Mm -hmm. I guess, um, first and foremost, I uh, would like to thank the, uh, the commission for the opportunity to uh, give you a first look uh, informally. Uh, at the, um, the proposed um, addition renovations that uh, we're putting forth for the uh, public library project. Uh, TAP A has a, a presentation queued up, um, and I think Jeff will have that ready. He was requested that be presented uh, via the Zoom platform for the, um, those participating remotely. Um, so I guess on that note, without further ado, uh, Jeff, the, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, um, I took over the screen, I, I believe. Yes, and you have an image. Of, you have an image you may not recognize, or maybe many of you all recognize of, of the Fitchburg Library on screen. Um, but I want to just use that as a, as a starting point for um, our discussion slash presentation about the design of the renovation and expansion of the library. And again, I will reiterate uh, Matt's comment that uh, we really appreciate the commission taking the, giving us the opportunity, I guess, to um, to talk with you at this stage of design and and outline uh, what um, our evolving design um, is at the, at the time. Um, the time being about 50% through uh, the design development phase of architectural services. Um, in any case, um, I wanted to start with just a ba basic project overview uh, in a little narrative before I run through the images and, and to let you know, um, you know what we've been um, planning so far. And I'll begin with um, 
uh, you know, the, the Wallace building, um, which is the building that replaced the building we're seeing now on, on Main Street. So this uh, sort of lovely historic um, building was removed and replaced with the Wallace building. And our and our our approach to working with the Wallace Building is is I think one which would be considered adaptive reuse. Of course, we're going to be reusing it for its current um, purpose as library, um, but we're not. We're not, it's not a strict preservation pro project because we are making modifications to that Wallace building. Uh, those include removing uh, a one-story bookmobile garage and its um, and its uh, and its uh, basement area as well. Um, and but I think that the the main thing is that we're prever preserving is the essential core of that Wallace building architecture uh, while making some little changes. And I, I will we'll see some of the changes as I go through some of the images. Um, some of them include uh, making more glass um, in, in the uh, exterior of the building where currently there are brick panels, maybe adding a canopy over the entrance to main, from Main Street to make it more um, obvious and approachable and welcoming. And um, also at the Main Street entrance, we're going to be relocating some of the um, the memorial stones that that make up that monument in front of the building to a new location. So we have that to consider. Um, and, and then on, on the sort of the rest of the building complex that exists there, we're, we're, we're going to be removing the youth library and auditorium and replacing it with um, a new facility, a uh, new, new piece of building that um, um, you know, serves the, the the program for the library in ways that the existing facility uh, really can't. Um, but we're interested very much in preserving the legacy and memory of the youth library. Um, the new library uh, or the the addition part uh, or the expanded part of the library will include gallery space. And we want to employ that gallery space as a lo location to recall the history of the library, you know, through large flat panel displays with interactive exhibits, perhaps of, of the youth library in specific, but also um, the history of the library in general, the architecture of Carl Koch, um, and the contribution of the Wallace family, which begins, of course, with the, with the building that we're seeing here and continues through um, through the youth library. Um, there are other additional aspects of the youth um, library, that, um, which constitute, I think, artifact that we want to preserve. Um, those include the three large um, uh, owls, um, which are currently on the Newton Place side of the building up on the roof. Previously, they were on the courtyard side, but um, we want to come up with a way to reincorporate the, the architecture conceivably inside the youth library for their better preservation, but also conceivably outside. If we do, um, you know, we could preserve them and reinstall them on the outside of the building as well. Um, and then, of course, there is the magnificent enameled metal panel frieze that sort of envelops, draws a line around the youth library and parts of the auditorium and extends um, actually to the face of the Wallace building over entrance. All of that we either want to save in place in some instances and or reinstall on, on the new youth library. Um, so those are some of the, um, the parts and pieces that we will be um, using to celebrate the architecture of the building and uh, sort of the architectural legacy of it as well. Um, so I would just, um, I think, um, I think this would be a good time just to walk through some of the images that explains, you know, a lot of the basic intent. Um, so one of the interesting things that I noticed about, um, oh, let me see here. Oh, I'm not on the right page. Sorry. <laughs> but at the end of my presentation rather than the beginning, but here we go from, uh, from the beginning instead. Um, there's the, just over the door, you'll see this, uh, the seal, um, and that is the, the library, uh, the city seal, which is located over the, the uh, door of the library um, in that in image, but now currently located in the Wallace building. Here you see it in a early photograph shortly after the Wallace building was, was constructed and, and now where it exists today. Um, that's an element that we will you know, preserve in place, but it's just, um, it, it, it indicates that even in its day when the Wallace building was built, there was this notion of carrying over artifact from the building that was being removed 
and bringing it um, to the new building and putting it either inside or outside as a way of continuing that. And we want to sort of draw on that precedent and use that as part of our thinking as we sort of you know continue the, the history of, of the library on site. And then we have the youth, the youth library in uh, its Here's a glimpse of the youth part of that uh, of that building, um, and of course we see you know the, the metal frieze we've already mentioned. Also note the uh, display case in front of the entrance there. But also notice that the um, a piece of the building doesn't look like it does today. There is a frosted glass and clear glass uh, component to it. You see on the on the Newton Place side a grid that's you know three high and four wide. Um, that is a little bit different from what exists today. So it has had a little bit of change over time. Um, we want to remember that and uh, think about how we recognize that. Um, and here we see just another you know, marvelous black and white photograph from the day celebrating the architecture uh, of that piece of building. Of course, some of the character defining elements here are also the big roof monitors, a uh, critical part of a building that was really intended to be used um, originally um, only in the, during the daylight hours. Another view looking sort of uh, up Newton Place from Boulder. And of course, what we see here, which is kind of an interesting discovery in the imagery, is its relationship to the original library, which you see with, with its little monitor skylight going around the top there, um, which is interesting because, of course, the Wallace building incorporates that design feature um, in it as well, a, a skylight monitor bringing daylight into its core. So I think there's a lot of really interesting evolution through time and drawing on precedent um, that has happened on the, on, on the library site and all of it really compelling in terms of the building's history. Um, here we see the library more or less as it is today. I think it's probably a Google Street View image, not one I took um, with my camera. And you see how a piece of the building has changed. I don't know if you see my cursor when I move it around. Um, um, but the piece that was glassy now is brick um, and, and has some glass uh, uh, above it instead. So it's just, again, it, it's evolved a little bit over time. Um, sort of walking down the street, seeing the character of that and the three owls on the roof, which are now uh, on this side and previously were on the opposite side, but when HVAC improvements were made and equipment put on the roof, they, they got relocated to here. Um, panning a little bit up Newton Place, we begin to, the connection to the Wallace building. Um, just, um, and actually, this is a location where we will be creating new entrance to the building. And then the Wallace building itself, the top image being, you know, from the corner by, by, the, by the park that's diagonally across the street, and the lower image being from up Main Street a little bit. And again, a lot of this will not change um, in its general character and appearance uh, going forward, um, although we will be making measures to improve the thermal performance and, and other performance characteristics. This is um, a view inside the courtyard. Um, another important feature that the library has is your courtyards, both the youth library and um, the adult wing um, take advantage of the, the exterior resource in interesting ways. Here it shows, you know, relatively immature planting, so we can really get a sense a little bit of, of that overall space. A piece of the foundation in the foreground, of course, from the building that uh, removed. Um, some marvelous, again, images of the interior space showing that clear story window, uh, a little bit of a carryover from the original Wallace uh, uh, contribution, the building that was here on site previously. It also shows a bunch of um, artifact that we are either preserving in place or reinstalling, some of that being um, the lighting. Um, not all of it, but some of it, um, especially that which rings this floor opening and the, the ones that are mounted to columns, they exist there still today. And we believe we can, you know, reuse them and relamp them. Um, this is actually a, a view from uh, our, our model of the building that shows the design as it's come along. One of the things, I'll just go back a slide um, that, that you all know is that there are stairs at each end of the floor opening to the upper level, which was originally called the mezzanine. Um, and now we're just calling it, I think, the upper level. Um, but we are, as, as part of managing the building relative to current codes, um, we know that we can't have a floor opening that extends through more than two floors without creating an atrium, which then would require smoke evacuation 
And so we are, in fact, removing uh, half of each of the stairs. Um, so one end of the library, there will be a stair up, and on the other end of the library, a stair down to the basement. The stair down, we can enclose with glass partition at the bottom to, to uh, prevent us from, from having a having created in the modern code what was considered an atrium. Um, so here we see, as we look uh, in this view, which I think is looking um, to the east from the west side, um, at the at the far end, we don't see a stair connecting the upper level to the lower, but we do see, if you look carefully, a stair going down. Um, and then at our end of the library here, we see the stair going up. So it's part of a way that um, we want to work with the this existing interior architecture um, to maintain aspects of it while still being able to use it in accordance with, with contemporary codes. The other thing we're going to be doing here is uh, putting up uh, a railing extension while preserving the existing railing, which doesn't meet current codes. The pickets are too far apart and they're not tall enough. Um, so we're going to do gl a glass uh, railing that will allow us to, again, conform with current codes, make the building safe while still leaving the essential character in place. And I will I'll just interject that it will look better than this rendering, which has, you know, it hasn't been developed sufficiently at this point in our design to show just how much you really will only see the historic railing, even though you get the benefit of, of a new railing inserted into the space. Um, more interior space, um, which shows a little bit of wood paneling in there that um, we will have to remove, but we will use the same design as we replace uh, with new paneling in pretty much the same location um, as we go forward and in other locations, drawing inspiration from that wood paneling to inform what we do in other parts of this building as well as in um, the ex expanded building. I just want to walk through that history with diagrams a little bit. Um, that, of course, being the original library, uh, which was expanded and connected lightly uh, to the uh, the youth library. I think there was really just a sort of a, a lower level corridor of spatial connection. No no uh, patron experience that extended from one to the other. So it really was a, a separate youth library connected to the original um, the original building. Of course, that was removed uh, to uh, make way for the Wallace building, uh, which replaced it. And if I just see here, uh, I outlined in orange, if you could just see that in your screen, the part that we call the youth library is actually the linking, uh, which that, there was a linking element that was uh, removed to make way for the Wallace building. And the Wallace building is now the part that's identified in orange. And it includes the piece that reaches over to the youth library. That is you know, part of the 1967 construction, not the 1949, that linking piece there. And so um, with that in mind, we see now outlined in orange, the parts that we're going to remove to make way for in the library. So now they're ghosted in. And, and gone, and and then we talk about replacing it with um, well, with, with a strategy that thinks about the linking character, reestablishing a new link that will connect the the new and the old, and building that kind of a, as, as a pavilion sort of between the two architectures, the Wallace Building and the and the replacement, and adding into that composition a new youth library. You can see uh, quite a large footprint than the current one, and then adding in also a, a meeting room component, which was originally, again, part of that original composition of the youth library. It had not only the youth, it had the teen uh, which space, which doubled as meeting room, and also had um, auditorium space. And so our, our, our new design sort of takes all of those things and uh, makes them bigger um, and uh, arranges them um, you know, on the site in, in this way. And then we also add in a basement level under about two thirds of that footprint um, into which we can put a lot, a lot of the library, you know, back of house service functions. So the main level that we create is really all, you know, a, a, all patron space um, and, and service space below. Um, and there's yeah, the basement now highlighted in orange. So the, the youth library now, they're in orange and the, um, the, the rest of that composition with the, the meeting room, uh, meeting room components, both the small meeting room and the little community gathering space added in. And, and one of the obvious little references you see already, of course, 
to to the uh, the historic youth, the youth library is the roof monitors, which we're incorporating for the same purposes to bring daylight into the into um, both the meeting spaces as well as the youth library proper. Um, so I'm just going to transition from these uh, sort of diagrammatic models of the buildings to something a little with a little bit more um, development to show you know some of the things that we're we're proposing working on and developing here. So here we have sort of two views, uh, the existing building, of course, on the left, and the proposed uh, configuration on the right. Uh, one of the things that, um, uh, well, I'll get, I'll get into the details a little bit later. I'll just walk around the building from the outside. Again, uh, a perspective now from that the the, uh, the green space on, diagonally across from the library, the, the park there, looking towards uh, the library, sort of the, uh, the existing and proposed um, architecture, you get a sense of the massing on the site and a view from up Main Street. And of course, we, what's notable here is that the Bookmobile Garage is no longer present and we've redone the facade in a way that uh, resonates with the character um, of the other uh, uh, other bays on the building. And then the uh, youth library now kind of having a little bit of a visible presence from Main Street as well. We do have also in the site plan development, parking available, public parking available at this area and entrance through uh, a courtyard wall, through a gate into the library from this direction, as well as from Main Street, as well as from Newton Place. Um, one more um, additional view from the, uh, I guess this is the Southwest Meeting Room Pavilion, Youth Library, Wallace Building, as seen there. And then getting a little bit down to street level, uh, looking at it from up Main Street, looking back um, and pivoting around the corner a little bit. We see, um, we see one of the changes I talked about before uh, to the Wallace Building, and that is putting more glass uh, in this corner um, and more solid in, in other areas. Um, this is in response to the way the program organized um, in response to the building's position within the city. Uh, and that has to do really with creating, um, uh, capitalizing on the opportunity that exists from this quadrant of the building to look out across green space, to have the capacity to take in a distant view to nature uh, from a space within the library in this direction, as well as the courtyard side is something we wanted to, to capitalize on. And that meant, you know, uh, adding more glass at this area more administrative functions in another area. So we're sort of taking the bays and, and moving them around to, to create um, the kind of opportunity the library can provide if we just sort of work with the existing elements and reposition them. I say that euphemistically, of course, um, we're going to uh, be replacing all the, all the windows in the building with high performance glazing, uh, new curtain wall system in, in its entirety to replace that. And we'll be, you know, insulating the brick walls, et cetera, to bring it up to new, new standards of thermal performance for a building of this sort. Um, and then looking at it from, from down the end of Newton Place, or we've, uh, we're working uh, on the concept of adding diagonal parking on Newton Place uh, to give us some opportunity to put people right uh, in close proximity to uh, the building entrance. And um, so that we, that's what we're seeing along here. Um, and then we see the character of the uh, the meeting room pavilion, which is in foreground, drawing on some precedent from both Wallace and the um, and the youth library in terms of clear story with with some drop down windows and um, you know solid materials in between, trying to resonate again with the history that the building has, without being strictly imitative. You know, learning from that and sort of taking it forward into the twentieth or twenty first century from the twentieth. Um, here we see, of course, the freeze um, up here on the youth library and, the, and, and on the link. Um, our notion is to put the freeze back on the youth library portion um, for sure, all the way around the top of the youth library. And depending on uh, our capacity to salvage, you know, put it along the, the, uh, the meeting room uh, portion uh, here as well. The other thing this shows is sort of the, the, the entrance. Um, we're uh, not going to have the pit. 
um, here, which, which has the uh, cooling tower in it, um, bring that up to grade and have a short ramp that comes up to an entry portal uh, here into sort of this glassy pavilion, which lightly connects between the two uh, architectures, the historic and the contemporary. Um, at the historic entrance, um, we, we see you know, largely restoration work, again, with a, a, a change of material where we had had brick, you know, putting in glass, again, to capitalize on sort of the reading lounge space we have down below and the, the quiet reading room uh, above. So sort of an active sort of conversational reading room below and a quiet uh, reading space up above. And the, you also notice the, the monument is um, removed. And what we would like to do with that is to take those stones, which tell, of course, the, the story of the history of the library and um, of its benefactor and architect, and and relocate that. And we're 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 considering two spots. One would be on the exterior face of the garden wall as you approach from that direction. If you want to keep them on the outside, and so that story would be told as you approach uh, into the courtyard as your entry experience. Conversely, we could put them in the gallery um, as sort of a wainscot to our gallery space and bring them inside, which would, you know, for better preservation, perhaps that would that might be a move. Although they are granite and they have withstood the test of time well in the elements. Are, so again, we haven't uh, uh, made any determination about that, but that is that is part of our thinking. Um, it does show canopy here, um, cutting across. Um, which you would think is going to obscure this piece of frieze, which we're maintaining in place. Um, but that's sort of where we are with the modeling. This is going to be glass canopy and will not extend um, all the way up to the face of those, those panels. It'll stop and several feet short of that while still providing sort of this welcoming coverage as you, as you come in and out of the library. It won't interfere with uh, certainly a... a um, eye height view of the, uh, the the metal freeze that's there as you come in the library. Then just looking about looking on the inside and thinking about you know some of the um, uh, opportunities that a replacement youth library has, uh, referencing back to the original um, character of space. Here, seeing sort of the open airy um, space um, that the, the original library had by contrast to the space it has um, currently, um, we'd like to create sort of that new, that spatial opportunity that was provided to the youth of Fitchburg, you know, through their million penny drive to create this space, um, to give them that same spatial resource by greatly expanding the, the square footage. Well, again, trying to draw inspiration from that architecture. Another view showing, you know, more or less the, the complexion and character and um, and density of stuff really that's in that space, which um, compromises uh, its essential spatial quality. Really, a couple more views of that. Um, one of the other things we were looking at um, as we configure the uh, replacement uh, of this is um, the round columns. You know, uh, we're thinking that that would be uh, if we can get that to work with the structural system using round columns in the replacement building would be another way of again referencing this uh, period of architecture. Um, but this is a view showing, unfortunately at this point in time, square columns uh, of um, uh, sort of a rendered view of the new youth library, what it could be like with the skylight um, and more daylight in general and more space. It actually will have, of course, more books, um, but it also has more, more floor space for children's activities, um, including a, a, a program room specifically, you know, for story time and crafts integrated into that architecture. And this is a view you know, from the entry point, um, similar to the entry point we saw before with the service desk in the foreground. This is the, the new sort of uh, the new facility. Um, again, trying to take some, some, some design cues, from the, the youth library and bring them over while creating a much more expansive spatial resource uh, going forward. And this uh, comparably uh, in the, new meeting room pavilion, um, replacing the auditorium component, drawing uh, on the, the sort of the spatial precedent of the youth library, rather than the spatial precedent of the auditorium, which is you know very much an internally focused um, piece of architecture. And um, we're, we're sort of like not referencing that piece so strongly. Um, 
just to talk about the artifacts a little bit um, that are on site that we want to preserve in place. There are there is the sculpture. And I, I, I'm remiss and not remember the date of the sculpture, but it'll um, probably be uh, removed for its protection and then reinstalled in the same location uh, with a, when we redo the courtyard, which will be um, uh, the central character, the central space of the courtyard will be preserved while updating it and making it be part of the accessible path to entrance. Um, up on the free, uh, the cornice, really, I guess, of the uh, Wallace building, there are, uh, there are owls that punctuate each column bay. And all of those are elements that will be uh, preserved in place, restored and, and, you know, and preserved in place. And here we see a detail of the um, ornamental frieze over entrance, which will remain as it is. Um, then the, under the preserve and relocate category, um, there is the, the, the display case, which we would like to put back in front of the, the youth library and gallery space um, near the entrance to uh, the library from uh, Newton Place, you know, kind of like it is now, probably reorienting it as we try and fit it into the site plan in just the right way. And then, of course, the frieze and the owls are shown here in these in these two illustrations on the right. And once again, the frieze that connects um, the Wallace Library to the existing youth library, all the other elements will uh, try and preserve. Um, the, the panels, as were mentioned earlier, telling the story of the library uh, to be uh, relocated. Um, and just come to my attention earlier today, or actually yesterday, as we were going through this uh, presentation um, as a draft, we, uh, was, we, we noticed that all the bays are, are, are not the same. Um, as you can see here, some bays have you know, a, a narrow central panel, and some bays have a wide central panel. And we will reference that um, going forward as we, as we think about what's the right character of bay, uh, right character of glassy bay to put in the right place in the building um, as, as we think about you know, uh, rebuilding that facade mm -hmm. uh, to more or less align with what, what we see now. Then I have a couple diagrams uh, at the end here just of, of, the, uh, of the courtyard here. We see you know, the footprint of the overall proposed building, Wallace building being the rectangle up at the top, the pavilion connector to the new youth library and um, auditorium and meeting space. And in between, courtyard, which we really think of as extending from uh, all the way along the, uh, the south side of Wallace out to the, to Newton Place with the pavilion being sort of the light insert um, within that, you know, sort of emphasizing the, the connection through of that uh, space and the light connection. And, you know, here's a preliminary development of that, uh, of that courtyard, um, which um, shows the sculpture put back in place. There are several memorial trees in there. Um, I don't know that we can save any of them, uh, just because some of them actually look like they're 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 already on their last legs, and, and we would preserve them in place if we could. Um, but doesn't look like they're going to make it, so it's it's a question of uh, replanting some of those memorial trees uh, with new trees, and then developing the um, the courtyard as a new place to be, not only for adults but also for children. Um, it becomes that that outdoor opportunity that's shared for both, while separating the different uses um, in, in in that space. Um, and so that's um, that's the narrative that I had to to walk you through to tell you, you know, where we are with design and approach um, and interest in. Um, you know, preserving the legacy of buildings removed while still sort of updating library um, facilities to meet uh, really the, the, the program requirements um, for library service for the city of Fitchburg going forward for the next, you know, couple of generations. And that's what I have. So I, I appreciate you listening to my long-winded um, uh, narrative um, about it. And I'm interested in hearing um, your perspective and I open, of course, uh, I, I may have missed things. And if anybody from the library or colliers and et cetera have, um, have uh, more to add, uh, please go ahead. Don? Hello? Yes. Um, perhaps I missed it, but I am old enough to have a vivid memory of the announcement that Fitchburg was going to have the first children's library in the country. And I just wonder where you plan to express that so people remember or learn for the first time. 
Right. Well, I'm, I'm certainly open to other ideas, but certainly the, the ones that we have right now is to begin with the display um, that it, the current um, existing display case out in front of the entrance to the youth library, uh, which I think is a useful piece of artifact to recall it. But also we can depends that we can use that space as a container to celebrate the history by uh, one thing to do would be to place a physical model. Of the, of the part of the building that's been removed or the entire complex, perhaps, um, mm -hmm. uh, as it is, uh, and maybe also as it was, you know, referencing the, the, the original Wallace Library and have that story be told with a, a piece of, you know, uh, a model or a set of models that we use there. It wouldn't have to be a permanent display um, that could rotate in and out of it. And that display case be used to connect people to events and happenings in the gallery um, but also in the gallery is the other opportunity we have. And we've done this on a handful of, of, of libraries, not specific for the for uh, recalling the library history, but recalling cultural history for the community of building an interactive display. You know, it's a large touchscreen uh, display that would, when not used for other purposes, would cycle through uh, content, enticing content, like some of the images that we've seen today. Um, and more contemporary ones that we would take that tell the history of the of the library. And then, you know, if you were to walk up and touch it, it brings up, you know, perhaps additional detail or narrative um, that, that would be, you know, a way of engaging uh, a casual passerby with uh, an opportunity to understand the history of, of the library. Um, so those are, those are, you know, some of the ways we've been thinking of um, and, um, of course, the library is also a great uh, keeper of artifact um, and, and, and its collection. And some of those artifacts include the actual imagery. So should a, uh, somebody doing research on, on, on the history of architecture in Fitchburg or Carl Koch, um, the library has you know, the prints of the photographs available, um, which would be part of the local history collection um, in the library. Okay, and one, one other thing, um, of course, the original library was a gift from Rodney Wallace, who also uh, built the stairs at the end of Wallace Way that connects Pritchard Street with uh, Academy Street. So I, you know, in my mind, I often think about the connection, but at some, in, you know, in, in some form, it's really important to remember their collective um, contribution. And the um, the other point is that I believe that George Wallace um, built the, the uh, children's library in memory, as in, not in memory, but with recognition for all the work his wife had done. So there's there's some pretty interesting history that would be wonderful to you know make it available to people so they can yeah. readily see it. And what did it on the library? Hmm? What year did it take out of the library? Do you remember? I can't, I can't remember. 1965 or something. Was it? I, I mean, yeah. Well, it was 67 is when it was dedicated. It was after I was out of high school. Yeah. Yeah. So 67 it was dedicated. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Together, I think, with the Wallace family, uh, recognizing them in the, in the way you're beginning to describe, I think it's an opportunity to recognize the, the contribution of, uh, to architecture that Carl Koch made. Um, it'd be an opportunity to introduce folks to something that Keith introduced me to um, was the fact that Carl Koch did, has done other libraries, the, the library in the North End of the Boston, in the Boston Public Library System, which is quite striking in its context because it seems like a scale model of, of the Wallace building. Um, and also other buildings, you know, modern buildings uh, or modern, modernist era buildings in Fitchburg to use this as an opportunity to sort of draw that thread uh, through these pieces together and root them back in Fitchburg. Uh, well, George Wallace, but Rodney's son, I believe, was very interested in modern architecture. And um, he his own home um, up on Screwball, Screwball Terrace was also designed by Cobb. Right. There's, there is, it is woven together in really fascinating ways. Yes, and it is. I, I think it would be um, entertaining and informative to even 
um, you know, like, like I say, a casual passerby to sort of stumble on these interesting connections, um, which I have made by, you know, sort of delving deep and, and making the connections uh, through the course of the project, but they could make, you know, by sort of um, serendipitous discovery while on a visit to the library. And I think that would be um, a really positive thing to do. Thank you. But there's also a, you know, you go up Wallace Avenue and come back down to River Street. Right. The old White House building. Yes. Uh, was yes. also George Wallace's yes, that's right. architectural design, which looked a lot like the labyrinths for both Yeah. at the time. Yes. We could tell all his buildings. Yes, I mean, they're, they're distinctive. You could almost have a walk, not a walking tour, but a driving that's tour. Right. Um, so, one question Don asked was why this one was torn down. And I don't know exactly. I do know that we have photographs of. The reference level full of um, trash barrels collecting water because the roof was leaking so badly. Mm -hmm. I think it really the library all grew its space. Mm -hmm. I think they could have probably redone it and added onto it, but in the 60s, that's not what was done. And I know in the dedication, one of the things that George said was Rodney's grandson, George, yeah, grandson. Uh, Jr. I'm sorry. George Wallace Jr. was Rodney's grandson, said, um, I tore down my grandfather's building. And to make a better better library for the city of Pittsburgh and someday they'll do that to mine. So he's gave permission to redo it and make the changes necessary for the future because that's what he did yeah. with this one. And uh, one thing Jeff didn't mention is some of the art. And we do have Rodney's portrait when he was painted um, when he was uh, in the legislature. So that's going to be restored and that'll go back oh, to the building. Lovely. And then we have the bar relief of George and Alice and that'll go back Okay, that's wonderful. Sure. Yeah, it's just one more question too, though. Um, am I correct in saying that the piece of property that the library is on has yes. to be a library, library forever? That's what the deed says. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And Rodney gave it to the town in 1885. Yeah, I was just in Maine and it was struck by the fact they had no buildings for their library and they were faced with the same. Questions whether to tear it down. They decided to keep it. Yeah. And the lockout. You'll see, if you go around the state, you'll see some have added, some have not. Okay. Potential it. I know. I, I, didn't, I did not know uh, Mr. Wallace other than to say good morning to him. Um, but I always felt that he was trying to uh, help Fitchburg see itself a little bit differently. And I, I wish I could remember what he said when they dedicated the Wallace Civic Center, but it was like, you know, we're, we're up to date, we're, we're moving forward. I mean, it was, and I've never forgotten that. And that's what I think he was doing. Yes, I do. Yeah. So we have this mid-century modern building, which a lot of people don't like, but it's now become important. Yeah. Yeah, really, it is. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, uh, other comments from uh, commission members or library uh, team? Uh, it, I, I will give a kind of a, a little bit of disclosure, um, public disclosure, I guess. Um, I, I originally worked uh, with Mr. Anthony Tappe, when he was in a, in a partnership uh, with uh, Remert Hugens, uh, back when I um, first moved to Boston. And that was, uh, I just calculated it was over, I think, 52 years ago. Um, so that kind of puts, puts me back um, two years after the Fitchburg Library was built. Um, and uh, I, I guess my architectural education and uh, I, I know fellow member Sam Blair is here and he may want to comment or not, um, is that I, I kind of, uh, I was I'm realizing now that I was part of a historic era, if you will, and I'm becoming an artifact myself. Um, <laughs> long in tooth and long in ear. Um, but it it, uh, it it's kind of 
uh, in some ways kind of refreshing in that kind of working with uh, uh, not in Carl with Carl Koch and I never knew Carl Koch but with his contemporaries of the day and kind of the things that you know design was doing and uh, the hub of uh, American contemporary architecture that that Boston and Massachusetts was uh, during the time when uh, the, the current Wallace Library was was designed and built. Um, so it it is a and, and as a um, one other disclosure is that I I have actually acted acted as an architectural consultant with uh, Tape Associates, and that's where I met Jeff, and that was. Uh, over 20 years ago for about a, a one or two year period that I was consulting on the Hubbardson School with them. Uh, so as a kind of a disclosure, I, I know the firm, I, I know uh, the firm's predecessor, Anthony Tappe, uh, who Jeff has uh, communicated, to, communicated with me that you know, is still uh, alive and doing well. And uh, kind of the the transition of the of the firm and into you know the great library architects that they are, and I think Pittsburgh is is uh, um, happy to to have your team on board. Um, and and getting back to kind of what the historical commission kind of our role as as. Uh, in the enactment in 1975 of creating the Monument Park Local Historic District, uh, which we uh, recently, if you will, the, when the commission was kind of restarted again uh, a few years ago, uh, we're kind of discovering that the you know, administration of you know, our, res our responsibility uh, as a historical commission with the local historic district uh, we're trying to define it. And this is obviously a presentation where we're we're hoping to um, be able to uh, you know uh, assist in the process and at the same time making sure that the the heritage um, and and the specifics of the um, existing buildings, if you will, and the history and the architecture detailing and things are uh, as best uh, represented for future generations of Fitchburg also. Um, and as uh, Jeff has said, and Ellen has kind of said, that there, there are very few uh, kind of modernist, um, good quality buildings from the uh, mid 20th century uh, in Fitchburg, or not many places, and, and we are, and they're certainly over 50 years old, uh, and they are certainly contributing pieces uh, to our heritage, and it's kind of derealizing it. Um, so it, it, this is an informal presentation by the library and, and Jeff, and we appreciate having kind of a, an update. I believe you met with us in 2017, I believe also. And, and as Sharon knows, it's a very long process of getting to where, where we're getting closer and closer to having our library updated to, you know, to better meet the needs of our, our current generations of people. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm thinking is that uh, just emphasizing, I, I think personally in my own personal comments, this isn't the commission, is that the, um, you know, both the youth library and the, uh, which was a 1950s design, which was much different uh, than certainly the, the dynamic design of the, of the, 1960s main library and each has historically anyhow each has a a uh, kind of a piece in history uh as as we look at the evolution of contemporary architecture into modern architecture and, and uh, what what we have today and these these are elements that um I know Jeff and his team are working to uh, preserve. And I, I would um, I would encourage them to continue on this, this uh, kind of path 
uh, it, understanding your changing locations of the youth library and trying to get everything on one main level without ramps and changing levels and things, which is a, a great uh, challenge, if you will, to kind of make all of these pieces work and you know, still provide, uh, you know, so it becomes a you know, it's workable solution to everything. Um, but the materials um, kind of in, on the Main Street facade of the Wallace Building, our current Wallace Building, uh, as you and and on the the youth library that was roughly 10, 15 years before, have a um, probably a water struck uh, red brick that has a lot of deformities in it, or every fifth brick has a deformity to it in a certain way. Um, I, I think I've heard them called clinkers that when you, when you fire brick and certain, certain bricks uh, kind of deform, not like they should be if you're trying to make very uniform bricks. And during the 1950s and 1960s, we will see in uh, other buildings of, of this uh, design movement, if you will, we will see lots of buildings that had this texturized uh, clinker brick in it. And I think that the, uh, that material on on both of the buildings is kind of an important piece that you know being able to uh, retain uh, that material and if you're infilling or taking it out or whatever what your design appears like it is, is doing in some instances on the main street and uh, Newton court facades um, that being careful of how to, to handle that. Uh, I don't know if you could reuse the brick, if you can find new brick, uh, or rather than just taking it all down and putting in new smooth brick or something. I think that texture of it is is important. Again, I'm speaking personally to to the the design and uh, um, the historical content of if, of what our building was designed and the architect's intentions at the time. Um, also the, um, the casement windows, uh, kind of the profile of those windows. Uh, these, are, these are metal framed windows, I believe that are single glazed, um, probably manufactured by Hopes or whatever the, the uh, manufacturer was at the time, but kind of industrial type of window. And that is important to the era, uh, kind of also that kind of came out of the, um, you know, all the way back to uh, start of the uh, modern architecture with Walter Gropius and things like that, that was a large influence on the Boston architectural scene because of Harvard and uh, its school of design it had there. Um, and the, so the profiles of uh, mountain bars and uh, of types of windows, whether uh, we keep the casement windows and reglaze them with um, insulating glass or other ways of preserving them, I, I'm not sure, but it's something I I think the commission would will question as we're kind of moving forward. Um, you addressed kind of the proportions of the uh, divisions of glass as they meet the, the triangular ceiling peaks and things. And I think that's an important piece that you're recognizing. And I think that's, that's certainly a, a good direction kind of going forward. Um, I think making the, ex, uh, you know, practically making the accessibility with a lot more patron parking available certainly makes the, the library a lot more usable. Um, we're inviting, if you will, for people that to, to kind of swing in and use use the, uh, the library facilities in the future. Um, it, that seems like a um, kind of a good thing, but um, kind of uh, being able to kind of keep the reality of, of the spaces, I, I think, by having it all on one level, the youth library or in that type of scheme means the youth library has to kind of go away. Um, and 
you know, historically that's, that's, you know, could be an issue uh, or you know, it, it's a major portion and a major portion of the heritage of the land. Thinking from the historical commission's viewpoint is that that's a, a uh, it kind of goes against the, kind of the main thoughts of, of, of kind of the basic historic uh, type of things kind of throughout, throughout the, the Commonwealth. Uh, local historic districts, or uh, but uh, understanding, you know, perhaps hardships and things that that causes in programming things. That, you know, uh, what are the alternatives and, and ways of doing it, like you've kind of discussed so far today? And I I think it's important that um, at, as you're continuing your, your your refinement of your designs and presentations that, uh, you know, keep, keeping that strongly in mind of, of how we do it, not, not perhaps just on inside photographs and memorials to the old building, but being able to experience some of these things from the outside also. Um, I understand you know, most of the things you're doing and it's certainly the practicality and uh, being on the building committee of the library uh, several years ago and seeing some of your early schemes on it and so forth, I think the 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 thinking in revitalization of the spaces is 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 wonderful, and you know, kind of making it you know what it, it was a, is a public library and making it more for the public even as you're kind of going forward with your repositioning of things and the entrance in emphasis, parking, et cetera. So I think those are all applaudable types of things. Um, but um, you know, being careful with the in integrity of the existing elements and how, and you've mentioned some things about adding round columns to kind of bring back the piece and obviously the roof monitors of, of uh, the children's um, library, bringing them, incorporating them back into the new portions of the building, uh, and and probably well done, um, and having textures. And I, I saw the uh, rendition of wood paneled ceilings that are kind of acoustic ceilings that are reminiscent of those that have been in the library auditorium. This was the kind of sound control materials that um, Carl Koch used uh, for that particular library. And many architects of that era were using that similar type of things. And, and a lot of this, uh, particularly the old courtyard off of the, or our current courtyard off of the children's library with the outside inside fireplaces and rounded chimneys and uh, the decorative pieces. Uh, some of these things even have a um, almost a Scandinavian influence to them from uh, architectural architects like Alvar Alto and maybe Saren a little bit, but a lot of Alto types of things that perhaps Coke was uh, and I think a lot of architects were looking at those ways of, of uh, making the textures of our buildings more, particularly for the children's area and so forth, making the textures of the spaces uh, with the, you know, the large paving stones and, and the wood acoustic materials and things. All of these things cost money, I realize, and there's budgets that you have to meet, uh, but, but making them uh, making the patrons kind of feel at home and maybe kind of expressing uh, yeah, kind of the same thing. And I don't know how we reuse those materials and things or how we kind of recapture with, you know, without really making you know, a replica of it. Um, so it, those are challenges that, that, you know, certainly you've been grappling with. And I think that we as... Yes, there it is. Uh, the step ceilings, and I think maybe the right-hand wall of this has the slats on the 
similar to it. And these are little individual pieces of wood um, with spacers between them. And they're all varnished, probably oak, like you have in the background of your slide there. Um, an impractical room in today's uses, but it's, it is, uh, yeah, we appreciate your efforts of, of thinking of, of some of the, uh, the qualities of these areas and not losing it. Uh, Keith, I just want to, um, in the interest of full disclosure, I think that we're not able to keep it exactly the same level, the new youth library. Um, part of the logic for replacement or uh, the, the reason for replacing rather than reusing that piece of the, and we were only going to we struggle with using just the, even a piece of it before is that um, it's too low on the site. You know, it, it's, it's, as you know, you go down the ramp to get to the youth library, which means we can't like get a basement underneath it and we can't build a building at that level, which would have a basement. And so it occupies a piece of the site, which, you know, we have site constraints and we have so much program to put on the, on the site in accordance with the requirements from the MBLC. Saving the piece meant we had to have a three-story addition to sort of get all the square footage in. Um, and when we remove it, we can get, you know, most of it on. I, I, I say one level, but it's actually um, 17 inches higher than the Wallace Library, the floor level in at, in the current edition. The floor level in the youth library will be slightly higher so that we can squeeze the basement underneath it. Um, and so I just, I thought I'd mention that um, because uh, you did say that it was all on one level. Uh, and then you may have uh, just been, we may have misrepresented that as essentially one level, but it's not quite. The other thing I think is that, um, I, I think that, uh, and, and maybe um, Sharon can correct me because she probably opens and closes the windows. I think that there would, um, but. Um, no, they're metal. They're metal. Okay, then there's probably these Hope Steel windows. Okay. I was just I was rifling through the the old construction documents. And I didn't see a detail for it, but the, the, the sliding windows in the youth library got wood. The big walls that slid, yeah, they were wood. Oh. Uh, yeah, I I understand. I I believe you had you had said at one point in time that you know, this is a floodplain level. Uh, because if we are in the river valley here, and perhaps your basement level is governed by, by that, I'm I'm not sure. And yeah, it, it it influences. It. We we do want to raise our basement level up as as high as we can. Um, we can't get it out of the flood level because actually the Wallace building is in the flood level. The main floor of the Wallace building is still at the flood level. Um, we are, are being redrawn um, um, actually as we speak by Corps of Engineers or something. Um, and I think they will wind up being lower than they are now, which is positive. Um, but we're currently planning so that the basement windows are higher than that floodplain level will be. So the building can be you know, uh, uh, protected uh, by its, you know, its, its essential design from water pouring in at the lowest level uh, mm -hmm. going forward. I, I'm not sure if you mentioned, what what is the basement level, particularly in the new edition, being used for? I don't know the numbers. I'm sorry. The basement level of the edition uh, will be about 17 inches. Uh, well, no, I know I shouldn't say because I just don't know. I'm sorry. Um, I would be I'd probably no. misquoting something, so. Yeah, what 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 would be what would you use the basement? Is that public? oh in the basement we have um, you know technical services for the library, um, some and office areas, storage areas for library supplies, and some part of collection you know electric room, um, uh, staff toilets, um, and, and delivery and receiving happens at that level off the parking lot off of Boulder. Um, mm -hmm. And then it, the the linking element between the two has a basement level as well. Um, and in that link, we have um, I, uh, a couple more offices and, and storage, et cetera. Um, but all of those things, um, we're sort of relieved not to have to put them in sort of our prime real estate on the, on the main the main floor as it as it cascades um, mm -hmm. across the site. We, we don't have to put those on that level, which really gives us a whole 
a patron service level with with mezzanine for for teens and and uh, and and reference and uh, computers and makerspace and then the Wallace basement continues more or less in the purposes it has now uh, as the core of the collection is down there plus local history and and some administrative offices on the daylight side of the of the Wallace basement. Yeah, it, and I. You know, it, as far as the layout, I, you know, it seems like the the idea of having the public spaces for after hours meetings and things like that very accessible without, you know, as we do now, go through the youth library to kind mm -hmm. of get there. So that you know, functionally, that seems like a a good good piece. Any other, any other comments? Um, well, one point I think we can find to put a cafe. No, it, it's, we, it's called a cafe only because it's a place where people would be able to bring in pizza, say, and eat it, rather than try to eat in the regular library. Okay, so it's not going to be a place where there's going to be somebody selling. We may have a coffee machine. That's still to be determined. It's going to be a reading lounge, is what we're calling it now, so that people aren't confused. <laughs> yes. Right, we 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 call it we call it a cafe because we want that cafe vibe, that cafe ambiance, but it's food service um, location, so it's really more of a casual reading lounge. By contrast to the space upstairs, which is you know for focused concentration, a real quiet uh, space in a otherwise active library. So it'll probably have high top tables so people can sit and talk and be a act, more active as possible. Um, maybe one other thing you would you would admit the the two interior stairways in in the the front Wallace building, um, which are uh, kind of open open riser uh, architectural you know very prominent stairways inside. Um, I'm I'm wondering if if there would be a way to um, I, I think at least I, I think the one that when you come in the front entry that would be just to your right that's existing there uh, is for someone to be able to get to the various levels by walking instead of an elevator uh, that that they'd be able to I think it would be nice not having to walk all the way down through the the central portion to be able to get to it. It seems like that you know if we had to eliminate one of this the stairways to the the second level um, it seems more prominent, at least in my experience coming into the library, that was such a, an important, I'm thinking kind of historic detail of what the 67 building is, that that's so prominent. And if you, uh, for one, could you keep both of them and just eliminate the basement access there um, and then have a back stairway for, since the lower level, I believe is going to be just staff if there could be a it's, it's, it's public access. To it's public it. access, yes. Oh, okay. Um, but I think that you raise an interesting opportunity for us to explore, which is is maintaining at least one stair in its entirety, top to bottom, instead of taking away two halves of two stairs. Um, and I, I think it merits exploration for sure. Um, yeah, and you know, there's probably egress things that you need to look at also on that level. But uh, um, I, I don't know if others have any feeling like that. It was, I was. Um, yeah, well, my, what, what, what occurred to me is not that there are a whole lot of people from the lesson, but if they had to evacuate quickly, there's two other egresses on the second level. There'll be one, one onto Newton Place and one into the parking lot. Okay, so the opposite ends of the building. So there will be emergency stairs. Okay. It's yeah. not just, it's not just. <laughs> if I came in the main entrance and I knew I wanted to get to the second floor, the 
reference room or the maker space or whatever it was just above my head. I wouldn't have to and not do the elevator because I like the exercise. I wouldn't have to walk all the way down through the center, come all the way around through the balcony edges and then come back to the, you know, whatever's happening just over my head. Wait a minute. I thought you liked exercise. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. I, I think it's it, always we, we 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 say a good thing, but we really don't do it. <laughs> I, I think you you raise an excellent point and uh, something that uh, we will seriously look at, Keith. Okay, all right, thank you. This this is wonderful seeing it and and uh, all of you sharing it with us. Um. Any other comments from commission members, guests? The presentation makes it much more real. It does. And it's exciting. It does for us too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I believe our, our new uh, director of the library is present there too. And so we'd like to welcome her to the community. Uh, Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to work on this project. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're dropping you in the frying pan right away. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think Sharon was a less than a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here every day this week. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I believe. Jeff and maybe probably Sharon and others that have been involved with the library for a long time have have always uh, discussed the the poor functioning of those those skylights that we see down Newton Place on the Youth Library, and uh, there I think some of the history behind that was that uh, it it was. Coke's kind of reflection of Fitchburg and its industrial buildings that uh, particularly during the 19th century before electric lights and things, we had buildings that had uh, roof monitors or skylights that quite often had that, uh, that stepped appearance, They're usually facing toward the north so that we get good north light, not overheating in the summertime. So it was, you know, it would make a good artist studio. And the heat... And, Perhaps even the uh, the redevelopment property back there now, which was GE and other manufacturing before, seems though there were some on buildings of that nature, perhaps back in there or in the vicinity or obviously elsewhere in Fitchburg that um, may be the reason that they were there. Um, do, do they, and if that area now becomes a community space, I, I think your model may have shown one or two roof monitors on that space. Um, it, so long as they, they, they are functional uh, and you can darken them up if you have to, or um, and, and yeah, perhaps, yeah. perhaps other areas there um, I'm just thinking of kind of the street view of what it is now. And, you know, it, this is, I'm not sure if I know what I'm talking about here, but, you know, it, if, if the monitors were maybe a little bit more visible or moved to the, the parking side a little bit closer, or just looking at, looking at that, uh, maybe more than one, um, uh, Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a cost issue or impractical also. So I'm not trying to uh, create um, change in it, if you will. And just to kind of looking at the proportions of the 1950s facade, uh, the the size of the frieze, the 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 narrowness or in height of the uh, the windows that run along the top of the wall. Uh, being able to maybe be sensitive to that uh, in, in a little bit more. Uh, the existing the existing youth library, I believe, has 
very thin round steel columns or uh, that support that that part of the roof or the overhang. It's basically a building where the the wall is actually moved back three feet from the edge of the roof. And the structural system was on the outside there, uh, which, which is, you know, kind of going back to history of modern architecture. We see it in Corbusier and kind of other modernist types of, of buildings in the fifties and before, maybe not after that, but it, you know, I'm, uh, and I don't know if that's just kind of copying and, you know, if we're not going to replace it, if, if that's kind of a, not a good thing to do, but I'm just kind of throwing yeah. out some of these ideas of not to. Yeah. I'm trying to, to reference that notion that the columns and walls are independent of one another, which is a little bit different from the Wallace approach. Although clearly at the Wallace building, it's, you know, curtain wall tying between the columns. So there is that essential independence of structure from uh, enclosure. Uh, but sort of the, the the 21st century way of doing that is put the columns on the in <laughs> rather than the outside because we're trying to control the, the migration of, of heat and cold through structural elements of the building from inside to out. So while the walls, again, are independent, like that, um, you know, in, in, in sort of harmony with that thought, um, they're independent, but they're but the, the exterior walls are always on the outside of columns. So true, yeah. But any roof overhang, we have, yeah, that issue too. So yes, um, okay. Yeah, I will. I will. Uh, you know, appreciate all that you've done, and, and that's you know, this is this is certainly going to, is a uh, a challenge for the historical commission uh, to you know, kind of look from the history side and certainly uh, understand uh, the building owners and you know, which is which is us also uh, side of having a, a, a fine functional building you know, pride of the community etc and I think I think that uh, you're doing great stuff with it so thank you All right. Any other comments? We can uh, let these folks go. And I, I, I'm not sure what what your your schedule is. And do you have any? And I don't know, if, Matthew, if you have thoughts on this or the library of kind of when, or maybe you can kind of outline what what. What's the reality of, of getting the library funded and moving ahead? And when do you think you would come before us for a, a formal uh, presentation hearing on the design? And uh, it, I, I think we've, we've sent out our, our design guidelines for all of you to kind of see. Uh, I think we are compelled to address those during a, a formal hearing period and understand your your um, you know your reasoning and to be able to make a, a certainly a case for what your design options are and why why you're doing it uh, from you know all reasons and just to help us uh, be able to understand your intents and what you've uh, uh, what you're obviously doing to uh, uh, help save the heritage of, of what's there also. Uh, Adrian, to me, just a very quick, quick question for you. I appreciate you saying that. It, you're, when you say a formal hearing, you're not talking about a public, public hearing regarding the project, which commissions go. This is just another informational purpose meeting, uh, uh, the, meeting with the design team and, and the commission itself. This, this is just a public but informational meeting now, but our, our procedures with the Monument Park Local Historic District Design Guides Design Guidelines has a an application process where there are three different types of certificates that the historic local historic district commission will offer uh, to allow a building project to then seek a building permit. This this is through a city ordinance that was passed back in. 2075, 
Um, so there, it is a, you know, once, once we go into, if, if it, uh, if you're seeking a certificate of appropriateness, um, which would allow you to get your building permit in that manner, uh, and we and we issue it. It would mean that then the building commissioner could issue a building permit. So, in, in historic local historic district commissions are kind of the uh, a, in this case a stepping stone before building permits are are issued uh, by state statute, if you will. Um, I can, uh, AJ, I can get you a, a copy of that if, if we're- you know, I think that would be helpful to get that over to callers as well so that we can help understand and put that part of our overall schedule when we're planning the, the, uh, our DD and CD set. Mm -hmm. And then before implement, we're trying to get pull proper building permits. Mm -hmm. Keith, did we do that with the city hall project? Because I'm trying to remember that process right now. With, uh, no, the city- As I get older, my memory is getting proper. So <laughs> you're going to be able to help me out. Not the same. Uh, the, Not the same. Uh, going on the first thing, I, I believe I sent copies of the design guidelines uh, to Matthew and many members of the uh, building right. committee. Uh, Matthew, if if you could redistribute it to you to your team, sure, I will do that. And, and uh, if you if you need it, another copy, you know, we'll they get that to you. So you'd know who to make sure that everybody has a copy of that. Yeah. And, um, <coughs> and the second question was about City Hall. Yeah. Uh, this this is true. Pittsburgh has one local historic district, um, which means that local city government has designated as a as a historic district, and that is the Monument Park local historic district. It it includes Monument Park, uh, all the buildings on four sides of it, <laughs> include well not quite all the buildings the, the pizza place. Okay. Uh, but it does include the library building, both both the front and back. It includes the Fay Club and Lucy's Barn behind, which is now uh, owned by the theater, I believe. It includes the the brick commercial building on the corner of Wallace Avenue and Main Street, although it's non-contributing. Uh, it includes the Armory, uh, which is now the Fitchburg Senior Center. It includes the old post office or what is now the current courthouse. Uh, it includes the the old Superior. historical society building on Grove Street, um, which was. It includes the at the northeast end of Monument Park the old uh, unused. Uh, Gothic Victorian granite sided courthouse, which the city is going to be, I'm told, is going to be receiving from the state and is hoping to send out a. Wonderful when they want to be. Yeah, yeah. And it, it includes Christ Church, that whole block of what Christ Church is. And it includes the old YMCA building. It is one building to the east of Christ Church on Main Street. Uh, which used to have two or three stories on top of it with a wonderful uh, roof type. Yes. Understood. Okay, so that's the difference between the library project and the, the city hall project. Is that, yes. that that's right. Understood. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the education. Got it. Thank you. There's only one local historic district, and uh, we're fortunate or not fortunate in being in it. <laughs> Keith, to answer your other uh, question about the overall schedule um, this uh, later this week uh, which is uh, tomorrow we're, we're looking to um, make a determination about uh, essentially uh, what our path forward is in terms of the, the delivery method of the project uh, and uh, so it, with that information that would have a significant impact on the schedule so once that determination is made uh, we will be able to give you a better answer I think about what the timeline is because it will change based on how the project elects to move forward. Are there plans to close down the library at all during construction? That's also being discussed, is how the logistics will work. Uh, 
either engagement of a construction manager or design bid build. Um, it, it has a significant impact on, on who is where and when. So we're, we're looking to um, make a decision and move forward on that based on uh, a number of factors. This project will take in with that corner, right? Across Sorry? the General Electric. You, 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 you utilize that area, the parking lot, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> I don't mean to take the parking away from you. No, 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 away from that. No, we don't. it. don't need it. Oh, that's nice. So we have to start with this. Okay. Uh, any any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you all from the library and Jeff for your great presentation. And uh, we, uh, we're, we're, you know, as, as any of you have questions, feel free to certainly reach out uh, to, to the commission. Um, we'd, we'd be happy to uh, you know, try to answer questions in an informal way and uh, moving forward. So we appreciate the, you know, you're you're sharing with us where you are at this point. Well, thank you. 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 Thank Thank Uh, that's great. Thanks. Okay, uh, so uh, this is really exciting. Uh, yeah, to it's, see the, it's real. I have another meeting to go to. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah. And I can uh, with uh, I would uh, we can certainly uh, pass over the pieces in, uh, left in the agenda and take them up in. in our next meeting, if if uh, okay. that's good with everybody, or if any, if we will lose a quorum. So I think that. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Our, our just uh, next meeting is September twenty uh, ninth, and same place, same station. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.